Hi, I'm Mark Syme, the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ, and I would like to welcome you to the evening services of our church for Sunday, February the 27th. Uh, per usual, we'll sing a few songs and uh, we will observe the Lord's Supper. I uh, will have a message for you that hopefully will be uh, enlightening, uplifting, uh, and will give you something to perhaps think about. We are singing from songs of faith and praise. And since I know that many of you probably do not have this song book, <clears throat> I will proceed each song with the title of the song. So if you have your device, you can Google it and perhaps get the words and sing along with us. And so first, if you would turn your song books to number 288, the title of this song is Fairest Lord Jesus. <coughs> Fairest Lord Jesus, 288. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O bow of God and man the Son, will I cherish, will I honor, thou my soul's title of this song is In Moments Like These, 239. In Moments Like These. <clears throat> In moments like these, I sing out a song, I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice to the Lord, singing, I love you, Lord, singing, I love you, Lord, 
singing, I love you, Lord, I love you. In moments like these, I sing out a song, I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands, I lift up my hands to the Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. And before we partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, let's uh, turn to number 366. 366. The title of this song is By Christ Redeemed. 366. By Christ Redeemed. By Christ redeemed in Christ restored, we keep the supper of the Lord and show the death of our dear Lord until he His body given in our stand is seen in this memorial brand. And as we drink, we see the blood until he comes. And thus that dark betrayal night With the last advent we unite By one bright chain of loving right Until he comes I think this song uh, rightly fits the Lord's Supper. Um, we're singing about Jesus Christ and the fact that we are redeemed in Jesus Christ. And because of that, every first day of the week, every Lord's Day, uh, we keep the Supper of the Lord. The song calls it the Supper of the Word. I kind of like the terminology. And the reason is that we show the death of our dear Lord, and we will continue to do this every Lord's Day until he comes back uh, to us. The song says that his body was given in our stead. And it is seen in the bread part of the Lord's Supper. And uh, then it says, as we uh, drink, we see the blood. And we were, are instructed to do this until Jesus comes back. And finally... We just uh, want to remember that dark betrayal night and um, the fact that in the Supper of the Lord, we have one really bright chain of loving right. And we are to do this until the Lord comes back to us. And so let's remember Jesus uh, and the sacrifice that he made for each of us and help us as we partake of these emblems that we will uh, hold fast that memory. Let's pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that uh, uh, we see in the memorial bread the body of our Lord, the body that he gave as a perfect sacrifice one time for all, that through that sacrifice we might have eternal life. Bless us as we partake of this symbol of his body. We pray it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. 
Help us as we partake, dear Heavenly Father, and as we drink, that we will see the blood of our Savior flowing from his body, the life-giving substance uh, that flowed from his body. And uh, when it was done, um, Jesus uh, gave up his life for each one of us. Help us to understand the magnitude of this sacrifice and understand that the blood that he shed is the blood that washes away our sins. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. That completes the Lord's Supper. But usually at this time, uh, we also have our giving service. We are instructed in our Bibles to give back to the Lord on the first day of the week, that which we have been prospered. Help us to understand the prosperity that we have. Help us to understand that uh, it is only through uh, what we give back to you that our church can uh, do what it needs to do to evangelize the world and to help those who are in need. Uh, help us as we give to understand how, how great this uh, giving service is and the opportunity that we have to take a part, uh, take part in, in what the church actually does. Let's pray for the giving. Our Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful that not only we have the opportunity to give, but we're so thankful that we have the desire to give. We have so many wonderful examples of giving in our Bibles, and uh, we have but to turn to the widow, uh, to, to the Macedonians, uh, all of them that gave, and uh, they didn't always give out of their plenty. Sometimes they gave out of their need. Help us to remember that as the Macedonians, before we give of our monies, we need to give of ourselves. And we pray that we have done that so that this giving might be significant and it might help the church do what it's supposed to do. Bless us in our giving. We pray it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. <clears throat> And finally, if you would turn your songbooks to one of my favorite songs, number 595, the title of this song is I Come to the Garden Alone. I Come to the Garden Alone. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known i'd stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe 
his voice to me, his calling. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Thank you for sharing this singing portion of uh, uh, of our service uh, with us. I hope that uh, the Lord was praised, and I hope that we. Uh, all benefited by uh, singing praise to the Lord because the Lord is worthy of that praise. If you were there this morning, uh, you probably heard of what the title of our lesson this evening will be. Uh, it's something that you've heard of. Uh, it's something that you maybe have studied about. It is actually a teaching within uh, certain churches, certain denominational churches, and so it's something that we have to uh, examine. And so I hope that we will examine it both biblically and intellectually. Uh, the title of our lesson this evening is Predestination. And so uh, I'd like to help explain what this terminology actually means. Now, first of all, uh, it's kind of like the word Trinity. We know there's a Father, there's a Son, and there's a Holy Spirit, but the term Trinity itself is not in the Bible. Neither is the term predestination found in the Bible. But there is the idea there, all right? And so let's not think that uh, this is a way out term, that there is no relationship to the term, just like there's not a relationship to the term Trinity as we find it in the Bible. The word predestinate is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. And the term predestinated is found in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 11. And so these are found in scripture. And so the terminologies are there. Similar words are there. For example, the word foreknow, F-O-R-E-K-N-O. E-W, or foreknow or foreknew in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, uh, and in Romans chapter 11, verse 2, uh, we have those terms. Also, we have the term foreknowledge. We find that in Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Those terms are also found. The word foreordained or foreknown is found in our Bibles, if you would turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. It's another similar word that's found in our Bibles. And so with that, um, maybe let's, uh, let's go back to secular terms. Uh, in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, uh, the term predestination is there. It's a word, and so the dictionary covers it. And here's what it says. Predestination as, quote, the doctrine that God, in consequence of his foreknowledge of all events, infallibly guides those who are destined for salvation. Did you catch that? Let me, let me repeat that definition. The doctrine that God in consequence of his foreknowledge of all events, infallibly guides those who are destined for salvation. If we go to the electronic media vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, Wikipedia, uh, this information about predestination reads like this. As a doctrine in Christian theology... Now, and by the way, Wikipedia is a little more specific. All right, let me start again. As a doctrine in Christian theology, the divine foreordaining of all that will happen, especially with regard to salvation of some, 
and not others. All right, that's the dictionary definition. The dictionary definition says it is a preordained thing that God, because he's infallible, has predestined that some people here on the earth will go to heaven and others will go to hell. All right? It is predestined. In other words, <laughs> the ball's not in our court. If God has predestined that you will go to heaven, you're going to go to heaven. If the uh, if God has uh, preordained or predestined that I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell, and there's nothing that I can do about it. Hmm. So, with that in mind, where does this theology come from? Well, there were some early commentators going way back to the first and second centuries that took this term and uh, diced it and parsed it out for us. The commentator Hippo and the uh, uh, commentator Augustine, uh, they had their teachings about predestination. And one of the prominent uh, early, quote, Christian uh, men, whose name was John Calvin, took off with this. And so with that in mind, a common understanding of the definition is easy to see by breaking the term down into its two parts. And, you know, that's really easy. Uh, we've all seen the prefix pre. Pre means before. And we've all seen the word destination. It's the place that one is going. And so when we put the term together, uh, predestination, it means knowing beforehand where we're going. The same idea can be seen if we take the term foreknowledge. All right, for, F-O-R-E, has to do with beforehand. And knowledge knows that which one knows. And so for knowledge means that which one knows beforehand. Now, there's problem with this. The problem in understanding the meaning comes from what Augustine and what Calvin taught and what they taught about the word. The dictionary kind of points to the problem when it says, with regard to the salvation of some and not others. And so here's the big question that we need to ask. And here's where we will see where there, whether or not there is such a thing as predestination or not. Did God, through predestination, before the world was created, decide that some would be saved to eternity and others would not be saved and sent to hell? To understand this, we need to understand the nature of God. First, our presumption is that God created all things by simply speaking them into existence. Genesis 1, uh, Hebrews 11, verse 3. Now, since God is the creator, and, and we're not going to doubt that, God is the creator of all things, human beings, you and I included. He could do with everything and every human being, whatever he wished to do. And if he would have done that, we would be, to use modern terms, robots. Only the information that was fed into us would come out in actions, right? But 
from the very, very, very beginning, we see that God did not make us as robots who could not think for themselves. And could only do as God directed him. All right, here's where it gets tricky, and here's where the important part lies. When Adam, when God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he gave them the choice of obeying or disobeying. He told them the things that they ought to do and the one thing that they were not supposed to do. The first sin in the world came as a result of them doing what God told them not to do. God didn't push their button and say, yeet, and all of a sudden, Adam and Eve ate of that tree. Adam and Eve ate of their own free will. Now, certainly they were tempted by Satan, but Satan didn't make them do it either. They did it by their own free will. God did not make them do anything. They weren't predestined to eat of that fruit, of that tree. And so I just threw a term in there that is an intriguing term. The term is free will. We banter it about all the time. As a matter of fact, in our, our, our Wednesday evening Zoom class, uh, in the uh, first chapter of the book of Romans, uh, several people talked about the free will that people have. And let's understand, like Trinity, like predestination, the term free will is not in the Bible. But the idea of one having free will is there. Numerous examples of God's, of man's free will exist in the scriptures. Here's a couple of them. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15, the words of Moses, he said, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. God set them, those things in front of them. Death and life and prosperity, death and adversity. He didn't say, I'm sending you to life and prosperity. I'm sending you to death and adversity. He presented them. And Joshua, in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, in some very, very famous uh, uh, scripture, said, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, now get this, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. It was obvious that these people knew, right, that these people knew that there was a choice in whom they would serve. Both of these inspired men under their leadership said, people, you have the choice. Now, the same thing could be said about Jesus in the New Testament and in the inspired writings of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, Paul writes that he wants, that God wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the Lord. The Apostle Peter in, uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, says the same thing. He gives everyone the right to decide if he wants to follow Christ or if he does not want to follow Christ. So like Trinity, like predestination, the term free will is not in the New Testament, but the idea of having a choice is. Just like Adam and Eve had a choice of eating of that tree. Out in the wilderness, when Moses spent too much time up in the mountain when he was getting the law, we know that the people had Aaron make a 
golden calf that they could worship. God didn't make them make that golden calf. They did that on their own. That was a choice that they made. Now, the impartiality of God is what comes to the forefront here. Now, Augustine, who talked about predestination, had John Calvin take the term a step further and develop the idea that before the world was formed, God selected some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. And that is the ultimate result of predestination. That idea is refuted by understanding that the New Testament is dotted with terminologies, scripture, scripture, Holy Spirit inspired writings that tell us of the impartiality of God. Romans chapter 2, verse 11, puts it in exactly those words. For there is no partiality with God. See, if God was partial, then predestination, I get it. It works. But God is not partial. He said that the word was for the Jew and then to the Greek. It is for all people of all nations. That's what the Great Commission said. Go into all the world and preach the word. You wouldn't have to preach the word if it was already predestined where people would go to. There'd be no reason. When Peter went to Cornelius, the first uh, Gentile to become a Christian, here's what Peter said. I most certainly understand now that God is not one who shows partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Acts chapter 20, verses 34 to 35. And so, since the Bible does not talk of predestination, and since God does not predetermine individuals' individu uh, eternal destiny, what is biblical predestination? All right, here we go. You're going to catch it. You're going to get a catchy term here, the, the key to the lesson here, and, and take the term. You can have it for yourself. All right, here it is. God predestined the plan, not the man. God predestined the plan, not the man. That means that God set in place a plan that if anyone will follow him, they will get to go to heaven. He also in that plan said, if one refuses to follow that will lead one to hell. God did not predetermine where people would spend eternity. What he did predetermine was, here's the plan. Follow me and you live with me eternally. Choose not to follow me and you will be lost and gone from me forever. God predestined. Yes, he did. He predestined with his plan not the man. The Calvinistic doctrine of God selecting who goes to heaven and who goes to hell has had a, a, a tremendous impact on religious thinking in the world. But the Bible refutes this, and it gives each person the right to make a choice, free will, if you will, so that each person decides whether he or she will live a life that will lead them to the reward of heaven or the punishment of hell. And brethren, that's what it is all about. It is about following Jesus into salvation. We make the choice. That's why at the end of every lesson, most preachers offer an invitation 
They offer an invitation for people to make that choice to be part of God's plan. God's plan was that all would come to him. But he gave us the choice to accept or to refute. And he put the plan in very, very simple terms. He said, with your lips, you must confess that Jesus Christ is the son of God. You need to take that life you used to live and say, I don't want that life. And you must be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. This is God's plan. And if we choose to follow that God's plan, that plan will take us to living with God eternally. And so the invitation with that is open to you. If you need to come to the Lord this evening, please get in contact with one of us and we will be at your ready to allow you to comply with God's plan so that you too can start your journey to heaven. If you need to come, please, this is the time for you to do so. I hope that this lesson has been beneficial to us I hope that it has cleared some things up and has intellectually stimulated you just a little bit, as it did for me as I prepared it. Let's uh, finish our service with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for uh, those that uh, 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 are willing to look into your scriptures to find out the truth that is there, to find out the truth of your word, that uh, our God is an impartial God. It's so wonderful for, us, for, wonderful for us to know that. And it's so wonderful for us to know that he gave us an intellectuality that uh, allowed us to follow his plan for us to heaven. We just uh, thank you for your part in our lives. I want to offer uh, Andy Figueroa's son, Christopher, to you this evening as he had a skiing accident this past weekend is in recovery. Bless him and his family uh, as he is on his road to recovery. As the world is in turmoil with the uh, actions that are going on in the Ukraine, I pray that you would be with that situation, although you and I cannot... Uh, physically be a part of that we can pray about it and we can put this in your hands help us in all ways to to make that a part of our lives pray to heavenly father that you would bless us this evening help us to put our heads on the pillow and uh, think of you help us to rise in the morning and think of you be with us and bless us i pray this in jesus most holy name amen I hope all of you will be safe and God bless you all. There is the only Azure Blue, a God concealed from human sight. He did his eyes with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great might. There is a God. Set my free and evermore will.